the speaker and the, and the talk. Uh, a few things about the about today and today. So this is the second day of a reinforcement learning uh, virtual school. Uh, we had a little more than 500 participants so yesterday. I see that the number is uh, going up right now. So that's great. Um, so, um, so a few things um, uh, for the questions, just as yesterday, we will use the Zoom Q&A, which is at the bottom. So you can ask your questions and there is a team of teaching assistants that is willing to help. And if uh, some questions are still unanswered, I will just forward them orally to, to, uh, to Tor. And uh, for today's talk, we have uh, Tor in the, in, in the morning and in the afternoon, and then there will be Don Barry uh, giving a, a keynote at the very end. So let me officially start the, the talk. So this is my pleasure to welcome uh, Tor Latimo. So Torla Timor is a research scientist at DeepMind who works uh, mostly on this. Uh, Tor received his PhD from the Australian National University, did a postdoc at University of Alberta, then was assistant professor at India University, and uh, then changed countries again to uh, work uh, at DeepMind. Uh, so Tor is a world-class uh, expert in Bennett algorithms. You might have already heard of his uh, book, Bennett algorithms, that he co-authored with Shabbat Chepezvari. And I guess you will see some content of it uh, in today's uh, lectures. So, so thank you very much. And uh, the floor is yours. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And, uh, and thanks to the organizers. I mean, this is a wonderful event. I think it's, it's fantastic that so many people can, can join for free. and. Um, that's really great. Um, so, so as Sebastian said, I will talk about two things today. Uh, in the morning, I will talk about bandits. And, um, and in the afternoon, I'll talk about Monte Carlo research. <clears throat> so I'm a little bit terrified that like my mic is not working and you're just <laughs> listening to nothing. So I just checked the chat briefly. Things are not going terribly wrong. It's fine. It's good. Okay. So, uh, Please do ask questions. You know, I think a lot of them the TAs will be able to cover, but in case not, um, I can also see the questions and, um, and and help out as well. And so in the morning we're going to do bandits, in the afternoon we're going to do Monte Carlo research, and and let's begin. So so bandit problems. This is an RL summer school or an RL virtual school, um, and bandit problems are, are related to RL, but they are a simplification of what we normally see in RL. And the the real simplification is they do not have a state, or more particularly, they don't have a, a controlled state. And, and so that means that when you want to solve a bandit problem, you don't have to consider the planning aspect that you have to consider in reinforcement learning. So there are no Bellman operators. Uh, you, you don't have to do, to do planning in that way. And, and the simplicity buys you a couple of things. So, so one is it buys you depth in the sense that you can really understand the bandit model uh, really, really well, basically. You know, there are aspects of the bandit model we still don't understand, but there are some that we understand now very, very well, um, which is a little bit in contrast to reinforcement learning, which is still more mysterious. And the other is practicality. You know, if you have a simple model, then it's much easier to design uh, algorithms that are good and are efficient and easy to implement. Um, and this is a good thing because the bandit model is already rich enough that it models lots of interesting applications. Um, that are that are important today and, and you know even even being used by by big companies and whatnot so so you know some examples are a b testing that's where on a website for example you want to decide if uh, one version of the website is better than another uh, you'd like to do it sort of in an online way while collecting feedback from your users uh, online advertising of course is a is a very natural fit for bandit models you want to choose between ads maximize your your click-throughs or revenue or whatever and then there are there are more more complicated things where bandits also play a role. You know, automated online uh, education systems that use bandits. Clinical trials is the 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 classic example, and I think uh, Don will talk about clinical trials um, this afternoon, I believe. I will also talk about tree search this afternoon, and we're going to see an application of a bandit algorithm as a small component of a tree search algorithm. Um, and then things like dynamic pricing, network routing. 
and um, and and ranking. <clears throat> okay, uh, and on top of this, it's a very active research topic. So there are hundreds and hundreds of papers written on bandits every year, um, and it's it's a I think a fun community to be to be part of. Okay, so so what is the interaction protocol? Um, you've you've probably seen um, interaction protocols for for IRL, and in bandits it's pretty sim similar. Um, it's just simpler. So you have some agent, and the agent is going to take actions, and the actions are usually going to be from some finite set. And there's also an environment. We'll just call this ENV, the environment. And the agent is going to take some action, which gets fed to the environment, and we're going to call that AT, usually, in round T. And then what the agent gets back is usually just a reward, RT. So sometimes uh, there'll be a little bit more information fed back to the agent. But there's never really a state, or if there is, it doesn't matter what actions the agent takes, the state is still going to evolve in some particular way, generally speaking. So maybe it's just stochastically you get randomly put in some new state. Um, but the action that the agent takes doesn't affect what state you get to next in general in bandit problems. This is sort of the key thing. And, and like in RL, uh, you know, the, the key thing is, is, is the environment is unknown. So you don't know how these rewards are generated. <clears throat> Maybe you know something about it. You know they follow this model or that, um, but you, you don't know everything. And of course, you want to get as much reward as possible. Okay, so this is, this is sort of the mission. So, <clears throat> so let's introduce some more specific model about how the rewards are generated. Um, uh, mathematically speaking. So this is this is the model we're going to spend, I guess, the first half uh, of, of, of the talk on. And, and this is the finite horizon Bernoulli bandit model. So, so here you have a horizon of n. This is called your horizon. So you're going to interact with the world for n rounds. And you have a finite set of actions just k actions, and there's no particular structure about those, those actions. And every time you take an action, you're going to get a reward, and the reward is just either going to be a zero or a one, and the probability that it's a zero or one is the thing that you don't know. That's this mu a. This is the probability of getting a one if you play action a. And that never changes. So every time you play action a, there's some fixed probability that you get a one or a zero, it's just that you don't know what that probability is, okay? And so of course the optimal action is, is the action which has the highest probability of, uh, of giving you a reward. So that's this A star. And again, because you don't know uh, the mu, you don't also know the A star, okay? So, so sort of essentially the challenge in a bandit problem is um, figuring out what these means are to an accuracy that's sufficient to, um, to play optimal actions. Okay, so, so just as a little demo to, to see what this interaction uh, actually looks like, let's just switch to a little bit of code. <clears throat> and I hope, um, I hope this is visible, it looks like it is. So I've created a, a bandit object here. Um, and well, B, we can just play it and we can play either arm uh, zero or arm one and we will get a reward. So let's say we play arm zero, we get a reward of zero. Uh, so that was interesting, maybe just bad luck, who knows? We play arm one, we get a reward of one, right? And at any time we can sort of look, just see a summary of, of what happened so far. So we've got two arms. Uh, we've played each of the arms one time, and one of them we got a reward of zero, the other we got a reward of one, All right? And so the question in bandits now is, well, maybe we just got unlucky. Uh, at the moment, arm one sort of looks a little bit better, but maybe actually arm zero is better. It's just we were unlucky in the first round. And so we sort of have to play a little bit more, right? 
Uh, so let's play um, one, it looks better. I don't know, we get another one. Now we get a zero, a one, and so on and so forth, right? So it's literally really looking at the moment if we if we print another summary. Now we've played them both four times and it really looks like uh, um, zero is, um, is looking quite bad. And well, I can probably print the means. Let's just see. Uh, fault means, I can't actually remember what they are. Okay, so the actual means are 0 0.3 and 0 0.6 here, right? So the first arm was returning a reward with probability 0.3 and the second arm was returning a reward with probability 0.6, right? So here, you know, the, the estimates after just four plays are not that good, right? Uh, we estimated zero, zero was our average reward on arm one, arm zero. Um, and so we really do have enough data here and you wanted to collect a little bit more data and keep playing. And this is the challenge in bandits. So you don't know what these true means are and you can play the arms, um, but of course you suffer some, some loss as you do that. So I'm sorry. Yeah. Some participants are asking whether they can get the code you are running. Uh, do, do you have a link for that? Or will you uh, want I do not. I can certainly share it after. Um, yeah, that's I fine. Think during the talk, it's probably not going to be necessary. Like, there's no particular practical component. I'll just use it to run a bunch of demos. But I'm I'm okay. happy to share it. It's not in great shape, to be honest. But uh, people are, are welcome to have a look afterwards if they, if they wish. Perfect. Thank you. For, for the second half uh, in the afternoon, there will be a practical component, and then I'll share the code uh, shortly after after this talk as well. Okay, so this is what the interaction uh, process looks like, and and you know if there are any questions about this Bernoulli bandit model, you know what the what, what the setup is, then now is is a good time to ask a question. So the first question uh, is: Does a bandit problem mean that literally there is no state, or there are states but nothing observable to the agent? Simple. So the answer, yeah, the answer in general is yes, and that's certainly true in this Bernoulli bandit example. Later, we're going to see an example where there is information like a state, which we normally call a context. And so that would happen, for example, if you're doing online advertising and users are coming to your website and saying, you know, show me the product I might like most. And of course, you don't want to ignore the information about the user. Uh, when you're doing that, you know, if you know something about their interests, what they've purchased before or whatnot, you should use that to make your decision. And so that should serve as a state and you should observe it. But the real point is that the action that you take, the product that you recommend them, you generally assume doesn't affect what users you get to observe next. Okay, that's of course wrong. Uh, you know, if you make bad recommendations, users will leave, the system will change a little bit. Um, but it's not a bad assumption, at least locally. And often it's a very useful to make these simplifying assumptions that your action doesn't affect what happens at the sequence of, uh, of events that occur. So uncontrolled state is the thing that really defines a bandit problem. But in many bandit problems, uh, there is no state. And that's true in the, in the Bernoulli bandit that we're going to start with. Uh, great. Do you want to take some further questions or uh, to proceed uh, further on? If there are more questions, that's good. Okay, so I think a uh, question about the code. What's the, dif what was the difference between average reward equals zero and default mean equals 0 0.3 for action zero? I think uh, so empirical, empirical average. Yeah, so the default means is just how I initialize the bandit. So that's the actual true mean, which you never get to observe. So that means if I played arm zero infinitely often, uh, 0.3 proportion of the time, you would get a reward of one, but actually you played it four times and every time you got zero, just like bad luck. So this example just illustrates that the average reward is not gonna be equal to the real thing that you, that you care about. And normally you would never get to see the real, the real rewards. Uh, and maybe a final question. Is it possible to know when our estimation of the unknown mean is accurate or in other terms, how to estimate the number of rounds n? Mm. Okay, so, so it is absolutely possible to have some idea about how accurate uh, uh, your estimation is. 
and and that is almost the most fundamental thing in bandits i mean it is a it, doing that is a huge part of doing a bandit analysis and we'll get there in a minute um in terms of what it should the horizon be um you know, you can have a mission, which is, you know, there are sometimes problems where what you want to do is just find out what is the best arm. And then you can ask the question, how big should the horizon be to do that? And that's a question that people do ask. And sometimes the horizon is just given to you and you want to get uh, as much reward as possible uh, until the horizon ends, you know, until the end of the day or, or, or what have you. So people study both of these questions. Um, and we will focus more on the first one where the horizon is just sort of given or, or the game just continues until some, some end point. Uh, but the first one is, is totally interesting as well. Okay, so I mentioned A-B testing. This is just an example uh, where, where these bandit problems are used. So, you know, you might have, have two versions of your website. You could have uh, version one has like uh, some, some column with ads. And version two has a header with ads. And you want to figure out which one makes people click on the ad more. And, and in A-B testing, then you have two actions. You have users coming to your website and you show them one or the other. And, and you record the responses as feedback and update with your banded algorithm. Now, th this is a, a good moment to say that, I mean, all of these things are, are uh, models and sometimes they don't fit perfectly you know what happens if, if a user comes before the earlier user has left or not clicked or something like that you might have you know users coming in overlapping and delays and things like that so in practice um, this can create complications which you have to handle but okay this is this is a very simple model okay so the problem that you really face in bandits is this exploration exploitation dilemma and and this is a thing which you face in RL as well, which is that you have over time, you develop some partial information about what the rewards of the arms look like in this case. And you have to make a decision. Am I going to play the arm which has given me the most reward so far? Or am I going to uh, explore an arm which I haven't played so much and therefore I might be a bit uncertain about what the actual reward is. And, and you know, so if you have a small horizon of say 10, you know, you've played the first action five times and you've got three wins, the second action twice and one win. Uh, you know, the first action looks better. If you only had one more round to play, you would definitely play it. Uh, but you have much less certainty about the second arm. Maybe it's it's worth to explore a little bit and and trying to decide how much to explore uh, each of the arms is is the big challenge. And and what we we look for often in bandits is principles for resolving this problem that work in many different kinds of problems. So preferably not just the Bernoulli bandit that, that I'm introducing here, but we want a principle which when you apply it, works in, in many, many different problems. And, and very often we care about principles which also work when you push them to IRL, right? So the bandits often serve as a proving ground for these principles. And then you try it on IRL and you hope that the, the planning aspect that IRL has doesn't, uh, doesn't cause too many problems. And so the principle I, I'm going to talk about today is one which does work in RL uh, and, and also works very well in bandits. And it's maybe it also works in life as well. Uh, there's evidence that humans do this. Um, but it's the optimism in the face of uncertainty principle. And, and this is the idea, you know, that you have a world that you're in, but you're uncertain about exactly what it looks like, right? There's things that you're not certain about. And you should act as if those uncertain things were as good as they possibly could be. Okay, so, so for example, if you visit a new country, you visit France and uh, you want to go out for dinner, uh, you could decide to go to McDonald's, you know, it's, it's well known, it's the same all over the world. Um, but you could imagine, right, you know, you're a little bit uncertain about what the French food is like, but you should, if you're being optimistic, think it's as amazing, which it is. And then you're going to try it, the French food, and either you'll like it, and then you'll be happy, uh, or if, 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 if unfortunately not, then you actually learn something new, right? Whereas if you always try uh, the thing that you know, then you don't learn anything. So, so being optimistic means that one of two things happen. Either you're going to be happy because your optimism was justified, 
or you're going to learn something and then you can improve in the future. Okay, and so, so in bandits, the only thing that you don't know, or at least in the Bernoulli bandit case, is the mean of each reward of each action. And so that's the uncertainty that you have. And, and the nicest plausible bandit is, well, we'll just all of the means are as large as they plausibly could be. Okay, you've collected some data, so you have some idea about what the means would be. Um, and you want to act as if they're all as large as possible. And so what this means in practice is, um, you know, you have two arms, arm one, arm two, and maybe you have an estimate of their mean. So let's call this mu hat one. And you have an estimate of arm two's mean. Call this mu hat two. Now, of course, you don't know exactly what they are. So you're going to create confidence bounds um, about what those means are. And so maybe you think that mu hat one lies in this range. And mu hat two, maybe you've played mu hat two much less. So you're much less certain about what its mean is. And you think it lies in this interval here. Okay, and then what the optimism in the face of the uncertainty principle is gonna say is, well, you should just act as if those means are at the top end of their confidence interval. So you should act as if arm um, two has this very high mean and arm um, one has this mean that's still a little bit bigger than the empirical mean. Uh, and then if, because in this particular case, arm um, two is optimal, you should play arm um, two. Okay, so, so that's what, what the principle says. What you have to do to actually make it rigorous and formal is to explain really carefully what plausible means. You know, you have to define uh, what these confidence intervals should look like. And for that, we're going to use the, the tools which statisticians have, have, have given us. And that's going to lead you to, to a concrete algorithm. Okay, so, <clears throat> so to do that, we need this little diversion into, into statistics. And so I'm gonna remind you uh, about the central limit theorem and then about something which you, you need if you want to actually do this in a rigorous manner. So, <clears throat> but I have to say, I mean, always the central limit theorem is the place to, to get your intuitions and then you should try and, and prove that your intuitions are correct uh, in, the, in the manner that you actually need. Okay, so, so what, is the, what is the situation here? So, uh, we're going to let uh, uh, R1 up to Rn be IID, so independent and identically distributed. And let's just say they're Bernoulli's, okay? So we're dealing um, <clears throat> in the, with the Bernoulli setting in the bandit problem, so let's just say they're Bernoulli's. And Bernoulli... with some mean mu. Of course, it should be in zero, one. Okay, so we have this sequence of, of rewards. And you should think of these as being the sequence of rewards that you collect for some specific arm. Okay, so the very natural idea to estimate the mean of that arm is just to take the average. So now we're gonna let mu hat be one over n, sum equals one to n <clears throat> RT. Okay, so that's just the average of, of the n rewards. <clears throat> and okay, so the average we think is a pretty good estimator and indeed it is. So what do we have? We have that the expectation of mu hat, of course, is equal to mu. And we have that the variance of mu hat. Well, it's gonna be the variance of the Bernoulli uh, divided by n. So here we have mu one minus mu, I guess, divided by n, okay? And what the central limit theorem is gonna tell us is something about the distribution uh, of mu hat minus mu. So the CLT, says that uh, square root n mu hat 
minus mu is approximately distributed by x. So what it would actually say is that the limit as n tends to infinity, this distribution would converge to a normal distribution uh, with mean uh, zero, of course, because we've subtracted off, um, off the mean and the variance would be the variance of, of the R, which is mu one minus mu. Okay. So it's important if you want to have a sort of a rigorous statement of the CLT that you get the normalization correct. So, right, we're not saying that mu hat minus mu is, is approximately Gaussian with multiplying it by square root n um, is approximately Gaussian. But, but the message generally is that um, what do we expect mu hat minus mu to look like? Well, if we, if we plug in our approximations for the central limit theorem, and we believe this is true, what we're gonna have, well, let's draw a little picture. So we've got uh, some table, let's say this is mu. And what we think is that the distribution is gonna look something like this, and most of the mass, so this is our distribution of mu hat, should look approximately like this. And this, these two points here, if you do some basic calculations about uh, the Gaussian, are going to look something like mu plus square root uh, two times the variance, which is mu one minus mu, divided by n, and then here it's just mu minus the same thing. Okay, so plus or minus that regime, that's roughly what you expect to see mu hat to be. Okay, and if you care about uh, really the confidence level, then you can get some logs appearing, something like log two over delta. So you're gonna expect one minus delta proportion of the time, the mu hat is going to lie in, in this interval. Okay, so this is an approximation based on the central limit theorem. It's not, uh, it's not the truth. So it holds sort of as n tends to infinity. Um, and that's, that's great. But for, for banded problems, that's actually not quite enough. Okay, so in statistics, this is a very satisfying result because the standard situation in statistics is you, you sort of collect data, you get more and more data, and the data that you collect doesn't really affect what happens in the future. And so uh, provided you collect enough data, things are going to be good. In banded problems though, it's a little bit different because if your estimate is really wrong at the start, right? So the central limit theorem is sort of not gonna be a good approximation for small n. And so if you try and use the central limit theorem in banded problems, what you might do is be uh, overly optimistic about how good your estimates are at the beginning. And maybe that will cause you to decide that some action is not a good action. And then you stop playing it, you don't get any new data and you never have time for the central limit theorem to kick in. And so that's, that's the problem in, in bandits. And so what you need really is a finite time version of the central limit theorem. And this is, this is Hofting's bound, uh, which I'm gonna use here. And there's like a, an enormous literature on this. It's a beautiful topic all by itself. And this is just the simplest result. So Hofting's bound says, uh, well, again, we're gonna assume that R1 and Rn are Iid Bernoulli's. Two L's, I guess, uh, with mean mu. And so now we can have a theorem, and I will not give the proof, but it's not terribly hard, uh, which is that the probability that mu hat minus mu, so mu hat again is the empirical average, and n, the average of your awards. So the probability that this is greater equals the square root. And now, um, now we're gonna do a little bit of a simplification. So just a half uh, times n log two over delta is smaller or equal to delta. 
Okay, so where where is this a half coming from? So if you remember, uh, you know, from CLT, what we were guessing was that it would look like square root uh, mu, I'm sorry, I should say two mu, one minus mu, log one over delta divided by n. And this mu one minus mu function, well, mu is the mean, it's between, uh, zero and one, and so the maximum possible value that that can take occurs when mu is equal to one half, that's when the Bernoulli variance is maximized, and then you get one quarter. And, and so that's sort of why you might not be shocked to see this one half here. Okay, but this is now a theorem and it holds for any fixed n, right? So we have fixed n, we get an IOD sequence of data, then we can get a confidence bound about how close our estimate is to the true mean. Right, and you can improve this, you can refine it, but for now, uh, this will be enough. And actually this result is a little bit more general. You don't even need that the rewards are Bernoulli, they just need to be bounded in zero and one. Okay, but this is, this is enough for us. Okay, so this, this has provided us with the tool that we need to formalize what we mean by plausible optimism about an arm, right? We can estimate the mean, and then we can have a confidence bound, which is going to hold at any time uh, and, is, and is valid. And this suggests uh, immediately the upper confidence bound algorithm. And I've, I've written it here in two ways. One is in the sort of the Python code way and the other is just in math. And so what the algorithm does is it starts by playing each action once. Okay, so you, you want to be able to define the empirical mean, otherwise you've got division by zero and whatnot, that's, that's not ideal. So you start by just playing each action once, and then you, you loop until the end of the game. So remember, there are n rounds in the whole game. And what you compute is, is what we call the index of an arm. So this, this mu hat, this is the empirical average So the average reward from arm A at the start uh, of round T. Right, so that's just the average of the reward that you collected so far. And this T A of T, this thing here, it's like some function. This is the number of plays. of action A, right? So this is, this is looking like our upper confidence bound that we, that we proved in the last slide. Okay, and you just play that and, and, and that's it. That's, that's what the algorithm does. And so I'm gonna give a little demo, um, but, but one thing to think about uh, while we're running the demo is here we used Hufting's bound to, to choose what, what this confidence bound should look like. That came from Hufting's bound on the previous slide. Okay, and in Hufting's bound, I made the following assumption. I made the assumption that the rewards are IID and Bernoulli. So while, while you're watching the demo, you should think about um, whether or not you think the theorem applies. I've run this algorithm, I collect a sequence of rewards for each action, that's a sequence of rewards, they're definitely Bernoulli. Uh, are they independent and are they identically distributed? So you should think about that. Um, but in, in the meanwhile, I will, I will run a little demo of, um, of this algorithm. So let's see what happens. Okay, so this algorithm is going to show you uh, what the indexes look like and what the rewards collect uh, <clears throat> are for, for sort of one run. And I hope this is going to stream reasonably well on Zoom. It looks like it's not too bad. Okay, so on the, you have five arms in this particular case, and um, you can see the blue lines are the UCB. So they're the upper bounds uh, of the algorithm. And then the red lines are the true means. Okay, so they never change, they're fixed. The algorithm sort of doesn't know them, but we're just showing them on the graph. Um, they're the true means. 
And then the green bars are the empirical means at the, the current time, right? And so what you can see is, is sort of as you would expect, the upper confidence bounds are always larger than the, uh, the true mean. Okay, that happens with high probability and sort of in this particular run that did happen. Very occasionally it will fail, but, uh, but that's gonna be uh, quite unusual to actually see. So the other thing which is sort of interesting to note is, you know, you would think that you run this algorithm and the empirical means of all the arms would converge to the true means. And they do for arms that you play a lot. You can see how many times you've played an arm uh, in the bottom below the arm. So you've played the first arm in this particular instance many times, which is good because it's the best arm. And you can see that its mean has been estimated really uh, well. But on the other hand, some of the other arms, the means have not been estimated nearly as effectively. And, and the reason that, that happens is the algorithm doesn't play them very often. That's a good thing because they have a low, low reward, relatively speaking. So this arm has only been played 19 times, the fourth arm. And so the reward estimate is not very good. And, and also because it's been played so little, the upper confidence bound is actually really high. Um, so it's, it's sort of an interesting effect that when you run this algorithm, actually what it does is it makes all the upper confidence bounds roughly equal. And then it starts playing the optimal arm a lot. Um, and every time it plays one of the suboptimal ones, you know, it, it, it sort of lowers the upper confidence bounds a little bit. So let's just run it again, see see a different run see it from the start. Right, so the upper confidence bounds, they start really high and you can see this jumping down effect. The, when you play the suboptimal arms, the upper confidence bound drops quite dramatically because it hasn't been played very often. And that's, that's what that squared function looks like. Okay, you can see the third arm, it's been sort of overestimated. So it gets played a little bit until the UCB is pushed down. But by and large, the algorithm is playing um, is playing the optimal arm most of the time. And that's that's what you want to see. That's all. Okay. Yeah. Questions? Can I, can I forward them? Absolutely. It's perfect right. time. Uh, right. So, um, so the easiest question is, can you explain what does UCB mean? <laughs> yeah, so UCB is uh, the value of, um, Let's go back a little bit. It's the value of this index thing here. So it's the empirical mean uh, plus the upper confidence bound is the upper confidence bound. And that's what's being plotted. So it's something that is uh, definitely going to be bigger than the empirical mean. That's why the blue bar is always taller than the green bar. And uh, that's what the, the algorithm is playing, the action which has the largest UCB. Then there is a, can you give more intuition as to why the upper bounds become equal? Okay, so, so why do they become equal? So um, what's gonna happen is the algorithm is always playing the action which has the largest upper confidence bound. That's the definition of the algorithm, okay? Now, when it does that, the width of the confidence intervals gets smaller, okay? So if you look at this, this second part of this equation here, we have the TA in the denominator. So as, that, as you play an action a lot, the width, the difference between the empirical mean and the top of the upper confidence bound, that gets smaller. That's, that's, that's what happens as TA gets large. And so every time you play an action, you expect its upper confidence bound to get smaller, right? The empirical mean, it might change a little bit, it fluctuates up and down, it slowly converges to the true mean, uh, but the, the width of the confidence interval just gets smaller, okay? So, so what the algorithm is doing is it finds the biggest upper confidence bound, plays the corresponding action and pushes it down a little bit, right? And for the optimal arm, what you can see is it's pushed the upper confidence bound right down close to the empirical mean. And that's because it's playing that arm so often. And, and so then what happens essentially is every time it plays some other arm, it's only gonna play it if its upper confidence bound is like a little bit bigger than the true optimal mean. And it pushes it down until it's just below and then it goes back to playing the optimal arm. So that's what's going on. Uh, thanks. And uh, maybe a last question. There are many questions, but I guess maybe just the, the, this one. 
or more if you if you want. Uh, it's it's of course equal uh, with me. So and here the upper confidence bound is used. Is it possible, or does it make sense to use the lower confidence bound? Well, uh, you can use the lower confidence bound for other things. Um, you would not want to use the lower confidence bound if you want to try and play the optimal action a lot. Um, and the reason is that if you think about, you know, you play each arm once first to get things started. And, and let's say the optimal action just by bad luck gets a small reward, so it looks really bad. And so then you start playing some other arm. And as a consequence, it's lower confidence bound gets bigger because you get more certain about the reward. And then you're just going to keep playing that arm, right? So if you if you try and, and maximize the lower confidence bound, you won't generally play arms that you're really uncertain about uh, because they have really low, lower confidence bounds. And so this doesn't encourage exploration. Um, there are other reasons to consider lower confidence bounds. They're very useful. Uh, if you want to make recommendations about an arm. So for example, maybe at the end of a, of a bunch of iterations, you want to recommend a user which arm you think is best. And there it can make sense in some situations to use a lower confidence bound because it provides a robust, you know, you can say, I guarantee this arm is at least this good. Um, okay, but not, not in this Great. context. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, so, so let me show another demo, um, and and this one is is showing the histogram of the regret. Okay, so every time you run the algorithm, uh, well, maybe I have to say what the regret is first. So let's let's do that, and then and then I will come back. So this is the regret is the thing that um, that we're trying to optimize, right? So I told you we want to maximize rewards. Um, and if people somehow uh, want to flip that into a negative thing, reinforcement learning people talk about maximizing rewards in general, and it's, it's always minimizing regret. So what is regret? Regret is just how well you did relative to how well you would do if you knew what the optimal arms were. So the regret, uh, and we'll define two versions. Um, yeah, the first version is just N times mu star minus, sum t equals one to n mu of a t. Okay, so remember that mu star uh, is the mean of the optimal arm. Right, so if you played the optimal arm in every round for all n rounds, the expected reward you would expect to get would be n times mu star. And mu of a t, this is, of course, the mean of the of the arm that you play in round t. Okay. So uh, because mu star is is maximizing, the regret is always going to be positive. It would only be equal to zero if you played an optimal action in every round. Okay. It's also random, right? So uh, this thing here. 80, 80 is random. It depends on like the rewards that you got and, and how your algorithm acts. Maybe your algorithm is random. So, so R is not a number, it's a random variable. And, and so it's often very useful to consider uh, R bar, which is just the expectation of R. So you're just gonna integrate away. And let's, let's make an N here, indicate that it depends on N. Okay, of course, it depends on the bandit, it depends on the policy that you have, <clears throat> um, but we're going to just omit those for now. Okay, so this is, this is the regret and uh, making the regret small is the same as making the reward large. <clears throat> okay, so, so now what I'm gonna do is run a demo where I show the histogram of the regret. So we run the algorithm multiple times and each time we get <clears throat> uh, some sample of what this thing is. Okay, and we're going to see, to see what that looks like. All right, so this is plot four, I guess. <clears throat> okay, so you can see in this particular bandit, uh, I think one of the means is exactly one half. 
and the other mean is 0.4. So it's a little bit worse and it's done over a thousand rounds. So the maximum possible regret you could suffer is 100, which is the regret that you would suffer if you just played the suboptimal arm in every single round. And you can see the algorithm, it's not really suffering that regret uh, often at all. Mostly the regret is around, I don't know, 15, 16 or something like that. And then it follows some distribution uh, about that. Okay, so that's the histogram of the regret. <clears throat> so it shows that there's some variability. Sometimes the algorithm is going to perform worse, sometimes it performs better. But let's have a look and see what happens if we change the algorithm a little bit. So, and here you can see how simple is the code for implementing UCB, right? So basically the whole thing depends on this UCB, the index. And let's just say I drop this bonus term. Okay, so what does that mean the algorithm is doing? It's just being greedy, right? It means it's gonna just play the action which had the largest possible reward. This S is a vector which is accumulating how much reward you got. Uh, whereas the T is a vector that's just accumulating how many times you played it. So let's see what happens if we run this algorithm. <clears throat> is this going to be good? Oops. <clears throat> wow, it seems way too good. <laughs> this is quite surprising. I have a feeling that what's happening is it's showing, it's not actually showing the regret exactly 100. Yeah, okay. so. You have to interpret this in a slightly weird way, but 0.7 or so of the time it's getting zero regret and more or less the rest of the time it's getting very high regret. Okay, so I have to fix this plot. Um, I don't know quite why that's happening, but anyways. Um, so if we, if we run this algorithm, then it is pretty good most of the time, but sometimes it fails catastrophically, right? And that's, that's not entirely, uh, entirely surprising. Okay, that's a little bit of a dud, a dud demo, but anyways. All right, so let's, let's move on and, and try and say something theoretically about this algorithm. Okay, so, so the regret bounds for UCB. So, so remember the regret is the following, the regret, is n times mu star minus the sum t equals one to n mu of a t. Okay, so it's how much you lose relative to playing uh, the optimal policy in hindsight. And r bar was just the expectation of that thing. Expectation of r n. All right, uh, so the theorem that we're gonna prove And this is for UCB. The, the regret or the, the expected regret, let's just say, R bar of N is smaller or equal to uh, some constant. Let's just call it a const. It's like a universal constant, like eight or 10 or something like that. And then we have the sum, uh, over the actions. And we're gonna sum only over the actions which are actually suboptimal. Okay, so delta A is equal to mu star minus mu A, right? So that's how much you wish you'd played uh, the optimal action instead of action A. It's the difference between the rewards that you would essentially get. Okay, so that's always gonna be positive because mu star is the biggest and it's only gonna be zero uh, for optimal actions. And now we have one <coughs> divided by delta A and then times log N. Okay, so N remember is the number of rounds that you play for. So, so one thing that this uh, is, is showing, so of course this, this, this R bar N R by N divided by N tends to zero as N tends to infinity. Okay, this is, this is called Hanan consistency. 
I just forget if it's one N or two. I guess it's two. Hang on, consistency. Um, okay, and what that means, right, is if the regret is tending to zero, well, the only way that can happen is in a, if an expectation, the proportion that you play suboptimal actions is tending to zero, right? So that's sort of the minimal requirement that we should have for an algorithm to be to be considered to be learning. Okay, so so I'm going to prove this, or at least I'm going to sketch the proof, give you the the main ideas for why this is why this result is true. Um, to make life a little bit simpler for ourselves, um, we're going to actually change the algorithm in a minor way. So, <clears throat> so the algorithm that I showed you running was playing at was the argmax of uh, mu hat. Uh, a t minus one, so that's the empirical mean that you observed so far, plus square root one over two t a t minus one log t, right? So t here is the number of rounds that you've played so far. Um, <clears throat> now this theorem does hold for this algorithm, it's just much more delicate to prove. And so, so what I'm going to analyze is the algorithm which plays more or less the same. mu hat a t minus one plus square root uh, one over two t a t minus one. And then instead of having log t here, we're gonna have log one over delta and delta is gonna be something like <clears throat> one over n squared or, or something similar to that, something small. And well, the first algorithm is much nicer to run because uh, it doesn't actually depend on the time horizon, right? T is the current round. And so what you can see is the confidence level is increasing as time goes on. So your confidence widths are getting slightly wider as a function of T. Whereas here we've just fixed them in advance. We've set them to equal delta and we've chosen delta from the very beginning to be one over N squared. So basically what we're going to say is we want a really low probability from over the whole game that our confidence intervals are ever wrong. And, and that just makes things a little bit easier to analyze. Okay, so we're going to analyze uh, this, this second algorithm instead of the first part. If you want to see the full analysis, you can look at the, the book or, or lots of different papers. All right, so, so there are sort of four steps to, to this analysis and I'll just sketch each of them, I guess. Okay, doing well for time. And then after that, there'll be a little break. Okay, so, so the first step is, is what we call a regret decomposition. And, <clears throat> and this is where we break up the regret. Uh, instead of looking at over rounds, we look at it over arms, okay? So we have R bar of N, it's the thing we care about, it's the expectation of n e star sum t equals one to n mu of a t okay so, Sorry, so if, oh yeah yeah there is a simple question but maybe you might want to address it now so what is the Oops. delta for can you explain it again what is the which sorry it's the delta for can you explain it again uh okay so the delta is um we call it the confidence level, right? So if we make delta really small, then this term here, this square root term is going to be really big. So in, in, in having a small delta makes it more likely that your upper confidence bound is indeed an upper bound on the true mean. And roughly speaking, the probability that it might fail is gonna be upper bounded by delta roughly speaking, right? And so if we want to have a basically a really small probability observing a failure, then we want to make delta really small. And why one over, well, why roughly one over N is because what happens in the worst case, if our confidence bounds fail, we might just play a suboptimal arm in every single round, and then we would suffer linear regret. And so we want the one over n squared or one over n to cancel that and make it really small. Okay, but basically delta is a parameter of the algorithm. We choose it and a good choice uh, turns out to be one over n squared. So great, you answered several questions at the same time. 
<laughs> okay. Anything else? Uh, I think there is a related question, but you might answer it after the sketch of a proof, which is, can you explain the, the factor log of t divided by ta, which is rather what you are doing here, actually? Maybe it's about the log t, but here it's a log n squared. Yeah, here we have a log n squared. And <clears throat> well, so the, so the two things are doing uh, are, are playing slightly different roles. So the the ta here, this is coming from the, the number of times that you've played action a. And so that's the, if you've played it a lot, then the variance of your mu hat is gonna be like approximately one over ta. And so that's where that's coming from. And then the log one over delta, this is like the, the probability that you want your confidence bound to be good. And so there's sort of slightly two different things there. But, but the main message is we want to have a high probability that our confidence bound is good. And we also don't want the confidence bound to be too big. And this is a choice that gives us that. Thank you in the name of the participants. <laughs> okay, so, so let's continue this regret decomposition. So the first step is going to be, we've got a sum over n things and then we have n times mu star and we're gonna bring these both under a sum. So we can rewrite this as the expectation. Uh, sum t equals one to n, and now we have mu star minus mu of a t. Okay, and and now what we want to do is start introducing actions. Okay, so I'm going to let uh, indicator of some predicate. So the one of some predicate is going to be the function, which is one if the predicate is true and zero otherwise. Okay, and so now we're gonna say this is equal to the expectation, uh, sum t equals one to n, and now we're gonna sum over the actions and have the indicator that you actually played that action. Let's write this a bit more nicely. AT, so AT is the action that you play in round A, and that's that indicator function is going to be one only when AT is actually equal to A. And now we can have mu star minus mu A. Okay. And now we can, of course, exchange the sum over the actions and the sum over T. And so this is now the expectation. Uh, sum A. And um, mu star minus mu a sum t equals one to n indicator that a t is equal to a. And this term here, the second sum, this is just equal actually to t a of n the total number of times that we played action A over N rounds. Okay, that's just what this definition of the indicator is saying. And so now if we exchange the expectation and the sum of the actions, we can write this as the sum A equals one to K, uh, mu star minus mu A. So that's the regret that you suffer if you play action A instead of uh, the optimal action. And now the expectation of T A of N. And, and this, this first term here, this thing just by definition is equal to delta A, right? And, and okay, so this gives us our conclusion. This is the regret decomposition, one decay, delta A, expectation of T A N. Okay, so of course, if delta A is zero, then A is an optimal action, and it doesn't matter how many times you play it, you're not suffering regret. And so we can say this is actually uh, equal to the sum just over the suboptimal actions. So we're going to sum over the actions where delta A is positive, and then, okay, T A of N, okay. 
So the result is going to be proven uh, just by showing that the expected number of times we play a suboptimal action is bounded by something. And, and what does that something need to be? Well, if we want to get the theorem that we claimed, then we need to prove the following result. Uh, so the claim is that the expectation of TA of N is small or equal to some constant uh, log N and then divided by delta A squared. Okay, and then when we substitute this, this second bound uh, into here, one of the pairs of deltas cancel and you get the theorem uh, that I claimed at the beginning. Okay, so that's that's the plan for the next part of the proof. We want to prove that the expected number of times uh, we play action A is, is going to be bounded. Okay, so let's let's do that step. And the second the second part is also a classical part of almost every bounded proof, which is to separate the probability from how the algorithm operates. Right. So this is this is a very nice idea when you're analyzing algorithms that are probabilistic or that are interacting with data is you want to define a, a set of events where the data is sufficiently regular and say if the data is in this event if this is satisfied then our algorithm is going to behave well and then you prove that that set happens uh, with high probability right and then you can separate the, the probability from the algorithmic stuff this is very a very nice way of simplifying your proofs okay so what are the events where things are, are good? Well, we want uh, our upper confidence bounds basically to be close to the real values. Uh, so the good event is going to be as follows. So, well, let's let's fix an action A. So, so let's let A be fixed, fixed action, uh, and suboptimal. Right. So the thing that we want to prove, uh, we want to show that the expectation of TA of N is small. That's our goal. Okay, so let's just fix, fix an action A and, and do it for a single action. Okay, so there are two, two actions that we care about when we want to prove that action A is not going to be played too much. And the two actions are action A itself and the optimal action. And so the good event, the good event is uh, is uh, occurs when basically when the estimates that we provided are good estimates in every round. So what we need is that mu hat uh, a star of t minus mu a star. Okay, so this is the difference between the empirical means that we have for the optimal action in round t. This should be small or equal to our confidence bound, which was square root uh, one over two t a star uh, t log one over delta for all t. And the second condition is about action A. It's exactly the same thing. Minus mu A should be smaller or equal to, and well, it's exactly the same, but we just have A instead of A star. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to prove that the good event uh, occurs with high probability. And then we're going to argue that um, provided that happens, everything is okay. Okay, so I'm going to make a claim now, um, uh, which I'll probably skip the proof of just to save some time. And again, you can you can just look it up in the book. <clears throat> um, so the claim the good event. occurs with probability at least one minus, uh, I guess it's going to be two uh, 
Uh, oops. Two and delta. Okay. Okay. Um, <clears throat> sorry, some weird stuff going on with my iPad, but it seems good now. Probably at least two and delta. So, so the only sort of um, tricky part here is related to this independence assumption, right? So, in the in the statement of Hofting's bound that I proved at the beginning, or that I didn't prove, um, we assumed they were independent, and and the problem that in bandit problems is that they're not independent. The sequence of rewards that you get every time you take a reward, it is independent from the history. But the problem is. Imagine I play arm one a few times and I get reward zero a lot. The algorithm is going to stop playing arm one. Whereas if I got rewards one quite a lot, the algorithm is going to continue playing arm one, right? And so the number of rewards that you get is not independent of the previous number. This, this, this T, um, these T's, these things are random and they depend on the data. And so you have to avoid this. It's sort of a technicality. You have to take union bounds. Um, but if you're going to do theory and bandits, then uh, you have to take this into account uh, and, and really learn uh, how to deal with these non-independence issues. Um, but it is a somewhat minor thing and, and we're not going to discuss it too much here. So now what we're just going to show is that if this good event occurs, then everything is okay. Then we have a small regret. And that's going to be the next part. Okay, so let's let's move on to that. So now we're just going to assume uh, <clears throat> we're just going to assume that these these confidence bounds hold. So mu hat a of t minus mu a is smaller or equal to square root t a t log one over delta. And exactly the same thing for the optimal arm. I just need to write it. Okay. So, so now what we want to do is, is prove that we don't play action A too many times. Okay, so how do we do that? So uh, let's make a, a, a few remarks. Okay, so the first one is that uh, mu hat a star plus so this is the upper confidence bound for the optimal action, minus one, log one over delta. This must be greater or equal to mu of a star. Okay, right, we saw this in the experiments. This is just saying that the UCB index is bigger than the true mean. Okay, this, this holds as long as this assumption about the confidence intervals being good uh, is true. So this holds for all t. Okay, so the second remark is we only gonna play action A, remember A is some other suboptimal action, only play action A action A if its upper confidence bound is bigger than the upper confidence bound of the optimal action. Right, so that's uh, we're only gonna play it if uh, mu hat a t minus one plus square root uh, one over t a log one over delta is greater or equal to mu hat a star t minus one a t a star. And that's just by the definition of the algorithm, right? The algorithm plays the action which has the highest UCB. And so it's only gonna play action A if it has a higher UCB than the optimal action. It might actually play some other action, right? So it's, it's not an if, it's sort of an only if, but not, maybe it should play some other action, but definitely if it plays action A, then this condition has to be true because otherwise it would play the optimal action instead or some other action, okay? And this we've, We've already seen is greater or equal to mu of a star. 
Okay, so then, then the third point is sort of going to bring it together. And that's under our assumption, we have that you had a t minus one plus square root one over t a plus one log one over delta. And I think I'm forgetting some twos here. There's no two here. Actually, this is just a one. All right, so this, this thing here can't be too big. It has to be smaller than mu a plus two times this confidence interval. Right, that's again using our assumption that the empirical means are not too far away from, from the true means. And if we chain all these things together, this implies that uh, mu a, oh, there's no t minus one here, it's just mu a, plus two times this upper confidence interval, log one over delta, this has to be greater than mu star. Okay, and, and if we rearrange things and, and solve now for t a of t minus one, this implies that t a minus one has to be smaller than, I keep forgetting the twos, I guess we're gonna get two over delta a squared log one over delta. Okay, so we, we've more or less done the proof now. Um, the only step that's sort of missing is here we don't have an expectation and, and there are kind of two cases, right? So here we've assumed, um, we've assumed that these good conditions hold. And in that case, we proved that T A of T minus one is smaller than, uh, than this thing. If the case doesn't hold, then T A of T minus one could be as big as N. Like we don't have any particular control over it, but the probability that that happens is really tiny. Um, it's sort of this N times delta. And so the thing that we conclude now is that expectation of T A of N is smaller or equal to, um, well, two over delta A squared log one over delta plus one, and I'll explain what that plus one is coming from in a minute, plus N, and now we have times the failure probability, which I said before was N times delta. And now if we choose delta equal to one over N squared, then this thing just contributes another one and we get a plus two. And, and why did I have one plus one in the first place? Well, I've, I've proven here that we only play action A if TA is smaller than this value of two over delta A squared log one over delta. So then we play, play it one more time. It might be like equal to two over delta A squared log one over delta. We play it one more time and thereafter we don't play it. And that contributes to plus one. Okay, so this completes the proof of our bound on the expected number of times we play a suboptimal action. And, and that summarizes the, the, the proof that we need. So, so what we have, remember, is now that Rn, or the R bar of n, the expected value is equal to the sum of the actions, uh, the, the regret, that action, and we only need the ones where they're suboptimal. And now we've proven that this is smaller or equal to um, well, sum A, and now we have two plus, I think it was two over delta A squared, log one over delta. And if you simplify things and you, you just ignore the constant factors, then, then this gives you the bound that we stated. Okay, so now is an excellent time uh, for a little break and, and some questions if, if people have them.
Okay, so let me look at the list of questions. So there have already been a list of some questions that have uh, found answers so far uh, by TA, so that's great. Um, okay, so um, so yeah, in your uh, in your sketch of proof, the the, the answer from the from Yad is, is really good. Uh, was how inequality in point two can be true? Did I miss anything? But it was the definition of UCB that, 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 that made it, right? Exactly. Exactly. Um, uh, okay, so this is good. Um, yeah, I, I mentioned why answering a question, uh, the lie on Robin's uh, lower round, because people were asking, uh, whether it it was fine that arms all arms will, would be played infinitely often, and I replied, actually it's not only fine but it's necessary, and I mentioned about. Do you want to to say a few words about that? Yeah. Um, so so essentially, what you can do is you can prove a lower bound, um, which looks a bit like this. Um, essentially, it's. It's a tricky business proving lower bounds for bandits because um, what is the situation? You know, I'd like to prove a lower bound for an algorithm, but an algorithm can do anything. It could just play the first arm always, right? That's a valid algorithm. And that algorithm will have zero regret if the first arm happens to be optimal, right? So it's not possible to prove a bound that says something like for any, uh, any algorithm and any bandit, the regret is such and such. And so there are two ways of sort of stating your lower bounds to get around this problem. One is to say a bound of the following flavors, so it's a minimax bound. You can say for any algorithm, there exists a bandit where the regret is such and such. And in that case, the theorem statement would be something like for all algs, for all algorithms, uh, there exists a bandit such that the regret uh, is greater or equal to basically square root n times k, with some constants as well that I've ignored. Okay, so that's that's one type of bound, that's a minimax bound. The other type of bound is where you restrict a little bit what algorithms you consider. So there you say for all consistent algs, and I'll say what that means in a second. And then for all bandits, so this is where you're winning. Now you're not just saying there exists some bandit where the regret is large, but you're saying that for all bandits, the regret is large. And the statement here is, is that the limit as uh, n tends to infinity, or even the lim inf of r bar n divided by uh, log n, has to be greater or equal to the sum over the suboptimal actions, uh, delta A. And here we have the uh, the relative entropy, the newly entropy between mu of A and mu of A star. And well, this, this relative entropy, if you do a Taylor series approximation is approximately equal to the gap squared. is approximately equal to uh, to delta A squared times a constant, which sort of depends on what the values of mu A and mu A star are. Um, and you can actually match exactly that lower bound with a different algorithm called KL UCB, which is basically exactly the same as UCB, but where you use a cleverer type of confidence bound. So thanks for the details. And uh, I don't know, do you want to make a break or take other questions? Yeah, I, I mean, I'm happy for both. I don't need a break myself. So I'm happy if people want to take a, a maybe a 10 minute break is a good idea. Okay. Um, but I'm also happy to take some questions. So there are uh, two other questions so far. Um, even if I think there was a misunderstanding for the first one. So the first one was we assume a random selection policy detected by the confidence bound. Could we consider a more deterministic or special policy to have a close form for expectation of TA, even if it depends on the other policies? Not sure about the question though. Um, no, me neither. Uh, 
in general, a closed form for the expectation of the number of plays for any algorithm is going to be really delicate. It's a complicated thing. Like even if you have a deterministic algorithm, which UCB is, uh, you know, UCB looks at the data and then deterministically makes the decision. But the data, of course, is random. Um, it's very hard to 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 hope for a closed forming there of the expectation of TA. Okay, so next question. Uh, can this theory be extended to continuous action space rather than a discrete one? Is this still a Bennett problem or something else entirely? Yeah, and we're going to get there in a little bit. Um, so obviously a problem, right, is if you have continuously many actions, you have infinitely many actions, if you don't have any connections between them, you know, you can't run UCB, you can't play all actions once. Uh, so you have to make a model that allows the algorithm to generalize between the actions, right? And that would be normal if you had a continuous action set, you'd have some sort of topology or a metric or whatever, and you'd assume that actions that were close to each other had similar rewards. And there's lots of work on doing that. Um, so, you know, you can assume that the mean reward is a linear function of the actions if the actions are in RD, for example. Uh, or you can assume the reward is maybe convex or Lipschitz. And, and depending on your, your assumptions about the rewards, you know, that gives you a different set basically where the unknown thing could be, right? If you assume the unknown function that determines the reward is Lipschitz, that's a bigger set uh, than if you assumed it's linear, for example, or linear with suitable bounds. Um, and, and then you can correspondingly define an algorithm. So, so, but you can still use UCB, um, but what needs to change is you need to modify your confidence bounds so that they allow generalization. And we're going to see an example of that in the linear case uh, after the break. Thank you. And uh, I think you're going to talk about that later. Can we compare Tosun sampling with UCB? Uh, yep. And we're going to do exactly that in just a moment. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, so I'll explain what Thompson sampling is as well. Okay, so I noted also a question that was uh, 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 partially answered by TAs. So in general, the distribution behind the homes are independent or can they obey a multivariate distribution? Well, um, it was the question, are they independent or? Uh, I think, yeah, the, the question, if I rephrase it is, uh, so. Uh, is it uh, are the arms rewards independent, or I can can we can it not be the case? I think it's uh, okay. Would rephrase it. Yeah. So so actually, it doesn't matter. Um, in the bandit problem, you play an arm, and you only get to see the reward of the the associated arm, and that's it. And and so what matters only, in fact, is the marginals. You know, you could define a reward distribution over a, a distribution over the vector of rewards that you get in each round, which might have some very complicated joint, joint distribution. But because you only get to observe one coordinate, the coordinate associated with the action that you played, the only information that you can extract from this joint distribution is the marginal. And, and so it might as well be independent uh, with whatever the marginal distributions of the joint are. There's no, there's no reason to assume joint distributions. What is absolutely essential is that over time, the reward distribution is constant. And if that's not the case, you know, then the optimal arm might be changing. Um, and that's obviously a very practical problem that occurs all the time. And there are algorithms that, that deal with non-stationary rewards, but that's completely essential for the, the UCB analysis that I showed just now. It actually rings a bell, the non-independent rewards uh, across arms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the last question, uh, I think there was some, uh, some clarification needed. Is sublinear the best we can do? Um, well, uh, the only thing sort of better than sublinear would be zero. Uh, you know, sublinear covers kind of everything between zero and linear. Uh, so in that sense, it's the best you can do. So the thing that you should try and do, right? I mean, as a starting case, you prove it's sublinear. That's a very, a very weak objective. And then you should hammer out what the rate should actually be. 
And this little discussion on this slide here shows that in a certain sense, the rate should be logarithmic as n gets really large. Okay, so we proved for UCB that the regret is logarithmic. And this lower bound shows that sort of for any sensible algorithm, the regret is logarithmic. Okay, what I didn't say here is what consistent means. Consistent basically means that the regret is, uh, uh, this thing here is, is that r bar n is little o n to the p for all p greater than zero. So subpolynomial basically. So if you have any subpolynomial algorithm, then its regret must be at least logarithmic with this particular constant. And we have algorithms that match that. So that is essentially defining what is optimal. Thank you. Uh, maybe you want to, to start again, or there is a last question, uh, as you wish. Let's do a last question. OK. So can you explain the plus two term again in the regret term? Oh, that's a very specific question. OK. So it, it breaks down into two parts. Um, so it was plus one plus uh, n times n delta. And we had delta was equal to one over n squared. N remember is the horizon. Okay. So the first, the first part, this part here, is coming from our analysis where we made the assumption that the confidence intervals were all good. And there we proved that you would only play action A if, uh, if this condition holds, right? So maybe you're going to get a, to a round where this condition holds with equality, t a of t minus one is equal to two over delta a squared log one over delta. And then you could still play a and only once more because after that, that condition won't hold anymore. Okay. So what we've proven then is that on this good event where the confidence intervals hold, the number of times you play action a is bounded by this. So that's where you get one of these plus ones. And then there's the bad event where the confidence intervals maybe don't hold. The probability that that happens is at most n times delta. And the number of times that you play action A is definitely less than n because you only play for n rounds. And so you have this n here. And then you multiply them out and add and you get plus two. Great, thanks. Okay, so let's, let's, let's continue and uh skip some things so i was going to talk about minimax bounds and i'll say very briefly uh what the point is so so remember that we proved this theorem for ucb uh some constant divided by delta a log n now an unsatisfying aspect of this bound is it depends on delta a and you don't know delta a and it could be really, really small, right? If I plot this function, let's just say I have two arms. So one of them is the optimal arm and the other is suboptimal. So we have just some constant divided by whatever that gap is, log n in the two armed case. And if we plot this as a function of delta, it looks bad, looks like this, right? Tending to infinity as delta tends to zero. Now, does that make sense? No, it does not make sense. Because if delta is really, really small, then the maximum regret we can suffer is actually just n times delta. And that should be small, right? So we all also have this trivial bound in this case is smaller or equal to n times delta, OK? And so of course, it's smaller than both. It's smaller than the minimum. This is just in the two-armed case, but it all generalizes of n times delta and this const divided by delta log n. And if you figure out what is the worst possible value of delta, then you can prove that this is actually smaller than square root uh, constant times n times log n. And if you do this when you have k arms, then you can extend this to, to say it's, it's constant times n times k times log n. Okay, so these are called minimax bounds or problem-free bounds um, because they hold for all bandits sort of uniformly and, and they don't depend on the bandit instance. 
Okay, and if you plot those, then of course you get a function like this. I don't know, like this. It's much more sensible. Okay, so this is a minimax belt, but I won't I won't say too much more about that. Okay, so I do want to say something about Thompson sampling. Um, and because this is a Bayesian approach, it works really well. Um, and it just provides another way of uh, well, A, it's another principle for designing algorithms. So like UCB uh, optimism, you can apply this in reinforcement learning or more complicated pandemic problems. Uh, and also it works really well. And, and so what do you do? You're going to take a prior on the mean of each unknown arm, right? So you don't know the means, you take a prior. And a very convenient choice in this Bernoulli case is, is to take a beta prior. Okay, usually you, alpha and beta are their parameters of your prior, and generally speaking, you'll just take them both equal to one. It doesn't sort of matter enormously what, what choices you make as long as they're not too big. Okay, and then in round T, what you can do is you look at the data that you've collected for each arm and you compute the posterior, right? So that's just your, you know, the posterior is like your probability uh, of mu A, uh, or your density or whatever, given given the, the history that you've observed so far, t, t minus one or whatever, All right? That's the sequence of data. Okay, you can compute the, the posterior density and we chose a beta because if you have a Bernoulli model, then the beta and the Bernoulli are conjugate to each other and you get a beta posterior as well. So it's just very convenient. And the beta distribution that you get is has new parameters that depend on sort of the number of wins that you got uh, and the number of, of losses, the number of rewards you got, right? And if you do a quick calculation, you can see that the mean, the, the, the mean of this beta, a t minus one, is just equal to alpha plus the number of wins divided by alpha plus beta plus the number of plays. Right, and so if alpha and beta are both one, this is uh, just approximately equal to the actually the empirical um, the empirical mean. Anyway, so what Thompson sampling then does is it samples a reward from the beta distribution for associated with each action, or it samples a mean rather, and then it just plays the action with the largest mean. So if we do this in pictures, uh, we have a bunch of beta distributions for the arms. And well, as, as the parameters of a beta distribution get large, provided they're not too disproportionate to each other, the beta sort of looks a bit like Gaussians. And so what you have is you have um, a number of arms, let's just say two, and you have a distribution, which is your posterior. They look approximately Gaussian, so that's maybe one of them. And then the other might look, I don't know, like this, so it looks a little bit bigger. And you're gonna take a sample from, from each of those things. So maybe the red one, you take a sample and you get this. Maybe the black one, you take a sample and you get this. This is mu tilde one, mu tilde two. And so in this particular case, the algorithm will play, uh, will play the second action. And if you think about what this algorithm is doing, well, mu tilde, of some action in round T. So this is this is the one that you sample. I can't remember if I used T or not, but so this is sampled from the, the BA of, of T minus one or whatever, that's your reward. Let's call it T minus one. Okay, so in round T, you take a sample from each of the posteriors. And well, this is gonna be approximately equal to mu hat, the empirical mean, plus or minus kind of the variance uh, of the beta distribution. And this is actually basically the same as the confidence bound that we used, right? It's approximately uh, one divided by the number of plays. Um, and then like, it's hard to know exactly what this log should be. It's like log some sort of constant maybe, but sometimes it's gonna be bigger, sometimes it's smaller because it's randomized uh, where you're sampling. And there's actually a variance term in here as well, which is one of the reasons why the algorithm does better. Um, but approximately what you can see is the algorithm computes the empirical mean for each action and then adds plus or minus to that randomly. 
And sometimes it adds plus, about half the time it adds plus. So, so one way of thinking about this Thompson sampling algorithm is an algorithm that about half the time for each um, is optimistic. And in particular, about half the time, it's gonna be optimistic about the optimal action. And then the analysis of Thompson sampling you can do in a way that's very similar to the analysis of UCB. Uh, but it's much, much harder. And the reason it's harder is, is, is all to do with this logarithmic term, uh, because in Thompson sampling, you sort of don't get to choose that. And it's very precise. And Thompson sampling is good in, because of that. It, it uses essentially very small confidence intervals, but it makes it harder to analyze. And, and just to compare the two algorithms, uh, we can run a little demo. Uh, so this is gonna show the histogram plot again. Um, but now we'll see a histogram for Thompson sampling as well. I think I actually have a demo for just Thompson sampling by itself. So let's do that first. Um, so this is sort of the same uh, kind of plot that we saw before. We've got the true mean and we've got the empirical mean. But now the blue bar is being sampled from the posterior, right? So you can see it jumps around a lot. Um, and on Zoom, it's a little bit hard to see it at exactly the resolution that that I see it, um, but you can see what's happening is, well, still the algorithm is playing pretty much always the optimal action, which is the first. And the blue bar is jumping around a lot for actions that it hasn't played very much. And that's what's causing it to occasionally explore, right? Often the blue bar is really low, but sometimes it jumps, uh, jumps very high. That's when you get a sample that's, that's at the top end of the posterior essentially, and then you might play that action. Okay, uh, and if we run the histogram, so um, let me just check that I fixed the, the UCB thing. Yeah, let's put this back. Okay, and um, run plot four. So now we see histograms for both. So remember, this is a histogram of the regret. So the algorithms are each being run a bunch of times, uh, but now we have Thompson sampling and UCB. And well, at first it's gonna be pretty noisy, so we can give it a little time to, to settle down. But you could see already that the gray histogram is pushed a little bit to the left of the blue histogram. Right, so the regret of Thompson sampling is generally a little bit smaller than, than the regret of UCB. It is possible, so if you use the KL UCB algorithm that I mentioned earlier, uh, then that's about equivalent to Thompson sampling if you do things carefully. But the nice thing about Thompson sampling is really, uh, there's not much to do. You just choose a prior that, that lets you uh, compute the posterior and then you can run the algorithm. The difficult part in Thompson sampling is the analysis. You know, UCB, we've had analysis for 40 years or so, and for Thompson sampling, it's only only in the last decade that that we've had a sensible sort of analysis, and it's still much, much, much diff more difficult. But okay, it is, a, it is a fantastic algorithm for this problem. All right. So the other thing I, I want to talk about um, is, is also Bayesian, um, and and you know, why are we doing this, this stuff? Why don't we just be Bayesian optimal, right? So we've chosen a prior. Once you choose a prior, actually the whole thing is just a planning problem, right? The, the Bayesian op optimal policy is the thing which maximizes the expected sum of the rewards. And, and this expectation now is, is, is over the prior and the interaction, right? So, before, when we looked at the regret, we were just integrating over the interaction. So the regret was a function of a bandit and a policy. But here, the Bayesian optimal policy is the policy which just makes the expected sum of the rewards as large as possible, where you're integrating over all the bandits with respect to your prior as well, right? So this is not a, a complicated multi-objective problem. It's just a single optimization problem. You just want to find the policy that makes this as large as possible. And this is fantastic. I mean, it works brilliantly. Um, but the problem is it's believed to be computationally hopeless because, you know, it's a really 
big planning problem actually now. Like, there's sort of no reinforcement learning. You know everything. If you're a Bayesian, then you know everything. Once you've chosen the prior, uh, you just you just have to roll out the big tree. But the problem is it is a really big tree. It's like every action you choose, you get a different posterior, you get a new posterior, and then from there you get another one and you have a tree up to depth n and you have to solve it by backwards induction or something like this. This is really hard to do. And I haven't actually seen a proof and we asked many experts about this, but everyone believes this is impossible and hopeless. But there is a, an amazing result from, from the 80s, which says that if you change the problem a little bit, then things get possible. And this is the discounted version. And I mean, if you're in reinforcement learning, discounting is already pretty widely used and pretty familiar. Um, and so here, what we change is, is two things, essentially. The expectation is still the expectation over both prior and, and posterior. But instead of uh, taking the reward up to some finite horizon, we take the reward up to the infinite horizon. And we also do discounting by, by a factor of gamma, and zero, one, right? And the policy that maximizes this can be approximated to good accuracy, basically depending on what gamma is. But if gamma is not too close to one, then it's really good uh, in, in polynomial time. And there are, there are sensible algorithms for for solving this problem. And the algorithm works, works brilliantly. It's called Gittin's index. And the very basic idea is, you know, if you want to solve this, this problem, uh, you get this tree which blows up exponentially with the number of actions. And that's, that gives you a, a sort of the, a K to the N kind of complexity for solving the backwards program. But what Gittin's was able to prove was that if you have this counting, then you can actually compute this policy by looking at each arm separately and computing a number for each arm, which is based on a, a, an optimization problem for just that arm. And then you play the action which maximizes that number. And the number is called Gittin's index. And he proved that the algorithm that maximizes Gittin's index is Bayesian optimal. And uh, well, we do, we have a chapter on this in our book and there's, there's Gittin's himself wrote a nice book which, which discusses it. Uh, and, and Don Barry's book also, also discusses it, I believe. Um, so, so this is very mathematically beautiful and empirically it's superb for these Bernoulli banded problems. It's very hard to beat. Um, and I think you can even show things like if you send gamma to be close to one, then you sort of recover a kind of VCB policy. You can prove that Gittins is, is behaving a bit like a really well-optimized UCB policy in that case. But there are two problems. One problem is it's hard to analyze. Um, so it's, it's hard to say, you know, you get it that it's Bayes optimal, but you don't know really how well it does on specific problems. But I think that's the more minor problem. The bigger problem with this approach is it's quite brittle. And the thing that it's brittle to particularly is the assumption that the arms uh, are essentially independent, right? It, it's that the prior that you choose over the means should be a product prior, should be independent. The means should be independent of each other under your prior. And if that's not true, then the Gittins algorithm does not, does not guarantee optimality. And for finite arm bandits, that's not a big deal. Where it is a big deal is if you have arms where you have structure, like somebody asked about before. If you have infinitely many arms, then you don't want to have a prior that assumes that all the arms are independent because then you can't generalize at all. And as soon as you add generalization, you want to do something like linear bandits or, or, or even worse, Lipschitz or whatever then it seems this problem becomes hopeless again. So, so as nice as the Gittins is, it, it seems it's, it's not quite suitable for many of the more complicated problems that are really popular in machine learning nowadays. Um, whereas algorithms like UCB or Thompson sampling, they're sort of good heuristics. You can even prove Bayesian that they're not too far from being Bayesian optimal. Um, and they're easy to generalize to more complicated scenarios. Okay, uh, so this is Gittin's index, and I hope that, that Don will talk more about, about this. And you know, he has uh, applications where it is a good fit. Um, and in those cases, it's, it's, it's a fantastic idea. Okay, I want to say one other thing about uh, finite arm bandits before I talk briefly about contextual bandits. And this is also, I think, a pretty amazing result. Um, so, you know, we've assumed here that, that the rewards are stochastic, 
And that's just never true, really, right? It's often a good assumption. It's a good idea to have a model where you assume stochasticity. We know that helps a lot. Statisticians do it and, and get great results. Um, but it's not really true. And you can imagine that the rewards maybe are not really random. And there is an approach which allows you to relax all the assumptions on the data, except sort of very minor boundedness assumptions. And, and all you're gonna do is change the, the way you measure the performance of an algorithm essentially. So, so we can let R be any sequence of reward vectors chosen in advance, uh, even, even by an adversary that looks at the code of your algorithm, right? So it's just, it's chosen at the beginning, this big block of rewards uh, that you don't get to see. And the, we're gonna say that A star is the best single action in hindsight, right? So if the best, if which, whichever action gives the best reward is changing from round to round, that can happen, but we're only comparing ourselves to the best single action in hindsight. And then we let the regret be the normal thing. We just compare how well our algorithm does relative to that A star. And you can prove that there exists an algorithm where the regret is sublinear, square root 2nk, irrespective of how the rewards are chosen. Um, so I think this is sort of pretty amazing. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a significant win in terms of robustness. You know, UCB will not work well in this setting at all. Um, you don't get logarithmic progression anymore, but, um, but you can still get something. And this is, this is, I think, a really beautiful field. This online, online bandits, online learning um, is really worth, worth exploring. Okay, um, in the last 15 minutes, I want to talk about uh, the linear setting. And, and, and this is a really practical setting. It's probably sort of the most practical bandit, bandit setting that there is. And so, you know, a classical example is you have users coming to your, your online site and you want to recommend a centerpiece product. You know, they, they arrive and you show them a picture of uh, hopefully not the the, like the washing machine that they bought last week, right? Like Amazon seems to do that too often. Um, so you have a bunch of information, right? About your users. You know what products that they've, they've purchased in the past, maybe. You might know some demographic information about them. And you also have a huge number of products potentially, right? Uh, and many of them might be similar. And so you want to use this information to make a recommendation. It's, it's, it's not anymore going to be a good idea to ignore the user information and just treat all the products as being independent products. You want to have a model that allows you to do generalization. And so the contextual bandit setting is, is one way of doing that. Um, so we're going to let C be a set of possible contexts. So in this case, that is the user characteristics. Um, basically, it's just the user characteristics. So we have some, we have some set of products and then we have some action set. A is, is equal to some action set. Okay, and in it, the beginning of round T, you you don't get to observe a state exactly, but you do get to observe some context CT, and that might be chosen in an arbitrary way. It might be stochastic, whatever. And and a rather standard idea for resolving this problem, you want to be able to generalize about contexts and actions, and a simple way of doing that is using a linear model, and and so here, what we're going to do is you're going to define a feature mapping. This is something you have to do as a human. There are ways to sort of automate it. People use neural networks and things like that to do it, but it, it's not part of this, this problem. It's, it has to be given to you. And so this is a mapping from the action set. This, this K is, is, is the action set, just doesn't really matter. It's kind of arbitrary, but K might be really, really large. So we define a feature mapping from the action set and the context to RD. And then we assume that our reward is a linear function of, uh, of the feature uh, with respect to some unknown parameter. This, this thing here is, is not known. And then there's noise as well to, to make life a little bit harder, right? And so now what you've done is you've reduced the number of things you need to learn. So previously what you might've needed to learn is for every context and every action you could learn the mean but that would be like K times the size of C number of parameters to learn. And here you only have D parameters to learn. And if that's, you know, you have a small number of parameters to learn, you should be able to do much better. And indeed, indeed you can. Okay. Um, 
So we can actually abstract this a little bit because all that really matters is the set of features that you sort of can play in each round, right? And so we can define a, a, a local action set. This is sort of a, an action set in round T. And instead of viewing it as playing actions, we're gonna view it as playing vectors, right? So that's the set of ve vectors associated with the actions given a particular context. And we're going to choose one of those actions. So our action is now just a vector in ID and the reward is just the inner product. So really we're just rewriting out here what's important. It's just there are the features that you, the features associated with the actions at the start of round T is the important thing. That's what determines the reward. Right. And now the next important thing is the definition of the regret has to change, right? Because we want our algorithm to depend on the context, the regret, we don't want to compare to a best fixed action in hindsight like we did before. That would be that would be a mistake because we would be comparing our algorithm to like what is the best product to sell to anyone, right? Ignoring the personalization. So here we want to choose really the best product for each person in each round. And, and this is why this max is inside the sum. Inside the sum, right? So we want in every round the action which is best for, for that person. Okay, um, are there any questions about this setup group briefly? Uh, just a single question about that. What's the practical difference between context and the uh, states? <laughs> okay, so the practical difference about context and states is we are going to assume essentially that the action that you play doesn't affect future context. We don't actually have to assume that. The algorithm is going to work regardless, but the definition of regret wouldn't make sense. Um, because you should plan early on to get contexts that you, uh, to get contexts later that allow you to get good reward or something like that. And this algorithm is not doing that. And their measure of regret is with respect to the set of contexts that actually arrive. Um, so realistically, we're assuming here that the sequence CT of contexts doesn't depend on the actions that you take. And that's, that's the difference. So we essentially have a state, but it's uncontrolled. That's the fundamental difference between the bandits. Okay, so, so we want to do uh, UCB for this. And, and I'm running out of time, so I'm gonna be reasonably brief on this. So, so how do we do UCB? So basically what we need to do is we need to estimate, uh, estimate the thing we don't know, which is theta. And then for each action, we want uh, A in AT. So this is this local actions subset of RD. We want an upper confidence bound. Okay. And, and so how are we gonna do this? Well, a very natural idea when you have a linear model is to use least squares. And so what we have here is we have, uh, so at time T, yeah. So at time T, we've uh, had a sequence, A1, A T minus one of the actions that we played. And we've observed the corresponding rewards, R1. So this is the data that we have. Rewards. And the least squares estimate uh, in time T is the minimizer uh, sum S equals one to T. And now we're trying to find the, which theta like would best fit the model. So we have RS minus, um, a s theta tilde squared. And if you do a little calculation, then you end up getting that uh, this is equal to, provided the, the actions that you've played so far are full rank, this is equal to g t minus one inverse 
S equals one to T minus one A S R S and this G T minus one is the design matrix. A S A S transpose. Okay, so this is just a calculation. That's the least squares estimate. And now you want to do sort of the concentration analysis. So you can show that if the A's were played in a deterministic way or in a randomized way, but ignoring the data. So if it were sort of the IAD, the classical setting, you could show that the expectation of this theta hat equals theta. Okay, not true in bandits. You have to be careful, but it's almost true. But the other thing that you can show is that the variance of how good this estimate is in a particular direction. This is, is equal to uh, A transpose GT minus one A. And, and so what this means, if we, if we just believe that our Gaussian approximation is all reasonable, which you have to prove that it, that it is, is that um, the confidence bound theta hat minus theta of A, this thing is gonna be smaller or equal to approximately some constant as it turns out. And then square root of the variance. A transpose GT minus one A, uh, and then some log one over delta. Okay, so what does the algorithm do? It does exactly what UCB does. It plays um, AT is the argmax of A. And now we have the estimated reward, which is A of theta hat T plus the upper confidence bound, which is this beta A transpose G T minus one inverse A log one over delta. Right, so it's exactly the same principle. We estimate the thing that we don't know we design confidence bounds about how accurate that should be based on the data that we've observed. And then we act optimistically. We act as if every action has the largest mean it possibly could in any plausible model. And, um, and if you analyze this, which I'm not gonna do because we have no time, um, you can prove the following bound. So the theorem, oops, the theorem, is that the regret for this algorithm is, uh, except for constants, d square root n, and then I think there's a log n that's outside the square root. Okay, but the real point is here, there's no dependence on k. So we have an algorithm where the regret just depends on, on the dimension d. I think that's, you know, that's a big win. So now you can handle an action set, which is potentially infinite. There's no reason why those ATs can't be infinite. They could be like a sphere or, or some crazy shape like that. Uh, but you have a regret that just depends on the dimension. And the reason that that's possible is because the, uh, the theta hat is, is generalizing. You've, you've got a model which has a finite dimension. And all of this can be generalized. You know, you can do this in RKHS spaces, you can, uh, you can you can generalize this idea to Lipschitz bandits, as I said, or convexity, or or other notions. Okay. Um, so so to finish up, I want to say a little bit about some things that I did not talk about, um, or didn't talk about very much, uh, but that I think are important. So you know, there's this adversarial model, which I think is very beautiful. Uh, it's potentially very practical. You know, it provides you this robustness, which the stochastic methods lack in some situations. Then there's the, this fully Bayesian approach uh, of Gittin's index, which I think is really beautiful, um, but it has, it has some of these limitations, which I mentioned for the more complicated models. And then 
there's a whole lot of really practical things. So there, are, so for example, common shorel bandits are bandits where you have really large action sets. Uh, and that's, that's very typical, right? If you have online advertising, you might have thousands and thousands of ads uh, that might have a combinatorial structure, you know, or you want to show, you know, you've got space to show five ads, right? And you've got 10,000 possibilities. So suddenly you have essentially uh, 10,000 to the five actions. How should you deal with situations like that where you can't even iterate over all the actions? You know, so UCB is not really going to work very well in situations like that if you can't calculate the UCB, you know, you solve that optimization problem somehow without iterating over all the actions. So it's a really interesting and practical challenge. And then if you're into the really practical stuff, there are lots of problems which are less commonly dealt with, but there is a growing body of literature on, on these practical issues. So, you know, non-stationarity is one which comes up all the time, you know, over, over the week or over a day, which ads or products or music is gonna sell or be liked is changing. Um, and so if you store your stale estimates and you use them in the future, that, that might be a bad idea. The only comment I have on that is if you can avoid non-stationarity by introducing context, then that's often a great thing, right? So if you have a contextual bandit, you can always add the time into the context of some sort of the day of the week, right? And so if the non-stationarity is caused by the day of the week, then you can just put a context for it and solve it that way. And this is often preferable. Then there's problems of delayed or anonymous rewards. You know, if you're doing advertising, the reward should really be like, did you get a conversion? But you might not observe that for ages or you might not know what ad caused it. Uh, and then of course you can talk about nonlinear contextual bandits. It's also a thing or where you have constraints on what your policy can do. You, know, you might have a, a safety constraint or you have fairness constraints constraints or things like this. Um, and then there's a whole set of problems which are different to regret minimization, which I didn't talk about. You know, a very typical case is you have a policy which you want to evaluate before you put it in production, right? But you have a production system running, which is collecting data. How do you use that data to evaluate the policy? Um, or pure exploration problems are where you want to just find the best action, but you don't actually care about the regret. You know, if you're doing a clinical trial with mice or something like that, so you're testing the mice with various different drugs, you don't really care that much what happens to the mice, but you want to find the best drug. Uh, and, and so there you have a different objective. You have a more statistical objective. It has sort of a sequential design flavor. It's also really fun. Um, and then of course, there's the big one. This is an RL workshop. You should scale this up to RL. And, and obviously that's a huge, a huge topic that I guess we're gonna hear more about as the workshop goes on. Okay, so I'm out of time and uh, well, I'm happy to take questions of course. And otherwise I look forward to seeing you in the afternoon session for something quite different. Uh, thank you to all for the great uh, lecture. Thank you very much. Uh, there are quite many questions, so I suggest we only take uh, one or two and maybe we can, uh, I can forward them to you and uh, compact them uh, easily and uh, we will send the answer on the metrics room maybe, uh -huh. if that's fine. So there were actually several questions related to Thompson sampling, like three or four of them, and mm -hmm. some more general questions, one with contextual, Okay, let me maybe ask the ones about Thompson sampling. So there were two related questions, which is um, given a good prior, is it safe to say Thompson sampling is strictly better than UCD? And the related question is by the same uh, participants. So Thompson sampling also use lower, can also use lower confidence, uh, which is different from UCD. How and when can this be good? So um, I think Thompson sampling with a sensible prior is strictly better than the default versions of UCB. Uh, but if you use a sort of reasonably carefully optimized version of KLUCB, then you can even do a little bit better than Thompson sampling. And we can prove some things like Thompson sampling is not minimax optimal, uh, but certain versions of UCB are. So, so there are, 
I, I think you can make a case that actually a really good version of UCB is a little bit better than Thompson sampling, but much more complicated. Um, uh, the other observation is Thompson sampling is actually quite a high variance algorithm. And, and that's a bad thing. You know, you're injecting noise, so it's not completely shocking that some of that noise turns up as noise in your regret. And, and it does. So Thompson sampling is generally speaking a little bit less stable than UCB algorithms. And that's something to watch out for. Um, but the other question, I'm not sure exactly what the, the person is, is getting at. I mean, essentially what's happening with Thompson sampling is it's randomly choosing a confidence level at each round and then randomly choosing whether or not to go up or to go down. And that leads in general to smaller confidence levels than UCB in the sense that the width of the confidence interval that Thompson sampling is essentially using is smaller. And that is a good thing as long as you don't push it too far. And the good versions of UCB also do this. Thanks, maybe one last question. And for all the other participants, I, I uh, apologize. We will just uh, reply later. So one last question, uh, I know Bennett, problems is stateless, but is there a generalization of Thompson sampling to a stateful process? Uh, well, there are generalizations of Thompson sampling to Markov decision processes, for example. Uh, and and if, you, uh, if you're happy for the state to be uncontrolled, then there are generalizations of Thompson sampling to uh, contextual bandits and things like this. Okay, so I think we'll, um, I think we'll stop there. Uh, thank you very much again, uh, Tov, for this uh, really insightful lecture. And uh, to all participants, we see Tov again at uh, 2 p.m. for uh, MCTS. Uh, and, uh, and in the meantime, I wish you all a, a nice lunch break if you're in French time or, or so, and otherwise uh, a nice break. Just that all. <laughs> thank you. Great. Thanks very much.